Don't tell. Well, hello. Welcome to the Backpack Show. We have yet another episode where I don't have the support and help of Carrie O'Shea Gorgon. Although she does still all kinds of things that make it better for me. She was helping me because I was messing up the calendar invites. So she was setting them back around again. We have two women-owned businesses today. Uh, one in the cannabis space. So we're going to talk to Autumn Shelton and Hannah Brand from... Uh, uh, Oh my gosh, I just blanked on it. So Autumn Brands. And we're going to talk to Andrea Bernholz from Swimanista. So women-owned businesses are, are, is our thing today. Cannabis farming is our thing today. And swimwear. Because you know what? Even though you may or may not have put on uh, a few COVID LBs, uh, swimming is coming around the corner. So we're going to have to get ready. we have to learn about it. So I'll say hi to the first few guests that are in the audience. I'd like to say hi to my biological father, Steve Brogan, and also his wife, Diane Brogan, who gave birth to me. Hello, mom and dad. Good to see you. We're going to talk about pot and swimsuits today, mom. Hi, everyone. Tim Kitzer from NBA Jam and NFL Blitz, welcoming you to The Backpack Show. Your host, Chris Brogan. Kerry Gargone, Boom Shakalaka. Backpack Show. So excited. Hey, Chloe. So good to see you. Hello, Elizabeth in Texas. Great to see you. Women-owned brands today. We have two women-owned brands today, so it's going to be great. It makes it sound like we've never interviewed a woman on this show, but, you know, what am I going to do? Uh, so I'm going to grab them, and, and we're going to start talking uh, really quick about it because I have about 8 billion questions of things that you've always wanted to know. So let's see. Autumn and Hannah. So Autumn Shelton, CFO of Autumn Brands and Hannah Brand. Uh, Hannah's in a very noisy environment because her coworkers are – giving her no uh no respite <laughs> so we're gonna have to do what we can but in and out of things so i, I want to talk a little bit hey janice in houston good to see you down the street from uh elizabeth i, I want to go i want to go right through it so i want to talk a little bit about autumn brands and uh you know, one of the things that I had uh, pulled as a little note was from tulips in holland more than a century ago to cannabis in santa barbara county uh What's that about? Like, what made you say, you know, there's a lot of sense why we'd want to start a brand like this, but tell us a little bit about this history and tulips and all that sort of thing. Yeah. So my um, dad immigrated here with his brother and my grandparents um, around, what is it, like 40 years ago. Um, so my brother and I are first generation American, and we have a line of six generations of farming that came from Holland. So you know, cannabis for us is just now our generation of farming, just like how tulips were back in the day, vegetables and cut flowers. So in, the, in in your history comes all this, you know, ability to work around, do farming stuff and whatnot. Cannabis is a different plant, though. It's a different crop. What, what made you put this together? And, uh, you know, I guess the obvious of, gee, there's a lot of people now that it's legal and, and whatnot, but how did you decide to form this business? What, what what went into putting this together? Well, Hannah's dad and our partner, um, he was growing cut flowers in the greenhouses that we're in now. And I was the CFO for that company. And he got approached um, to lease out a few of his greenhouses to grow medical marijuana under the collective model days. And under a lot of risk assessment, um, he decided to do that. And then shortly after, saw the opportunity and where cannabis was going and together we decided let's all do something together and change over this crop because there was so much competition with south america with cut flowers that this was a new opportunity and he saw this opportunity also for his daughter hannah and his son johnny who are going to be graduating from college a few years later in agriculture that they could come and be part of this because cut flowers just wasn't going to be uh, an opportunity that they were going to be interested in so at that time, that's what we did. We ended up switching over the greenhouses from cut flowers to cannabis um, under the medical marijuana uh, collective days and then transitioned into the regulated market in 2018. And auto brands were born. <laughs> On the one hand, it seems like something that you could... It, 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 it's, it seems like an easy transition in some ways and a really tricky transition in others. Now, besides all the regulations that come with this, and I mean, it's almost like I feel like that weight over everything that Autumn is is saying is like da da da, saying the words that make sure that people know we did this all legally over and over again. It's at every turn. And, and the rules change and the rules were harder, you know, over the last bunch of years. And I wouldn't say they're easier now, but at least they're getting a little bit more unified. 
there's a big risk to doing this, I guess, is what I want to say. And again, as, as CFO, you know, with your mindset, with, you know, looking at this versus cut flowers, this is a bigger change. I'm curious to know how you decide to press forward. And, and I'm also curious to know from, from either of you or both of you, what makes you go, all right, here's why this is going to be a worthwhile risk. And here's what we're going to do about, you know, mitigating some of the problems. Well, since we got a, a you know a little bit of an understanding of how it all worked in the collective model days, um, I felt really confident that we could really stay in compliance, do what we needed to do. But yes, back then when we started, it was still gray market. A helicopter went overhead, and you're like, ah, what's happening? Um, you know, and but being in today's regulated market, being it's legal in California, you don't you don't have that that fear anymore. I mean, back then too, we weren't talking about it. And today we can just be obviously very open about it and put out a consumer product um, that we're very proud of. So, you know, part of my job and duty as CFO is financials, but I also handle all the compliance side of it. So really understanding all the rules, all the regulations and making sure that we are in tune and in line with all that because we're business people in the end and we really want to be here for a long time. Um, so we're dedicated to this company and dedicated to doing it right. And it's very hard. And yes, it's uh, the new regulations and what you have to follow is certainly much easier under the collective model days um, than what we have to go through today. But once you get into your routine and you, you get in the habit of how everything needs to go, it's it's it works. Um, scrolling through your website, just sort of showing some of your products and all that. And it's walking through, for instance, your CBD. Uh, it's interesting to note just how many different kinds of products you can pull out of this. I wonder if that's different than sort of, you know, what was experienced before. Hannah, you know, did, tell me a little bit about that, the whole idea of how many strains, how many things, and, and the product line and all that. Yeah, so um, back in the collective model days, you're kind of growing a couple of strains and the best ones that were in your environment for the final product. But now having your own brand, you kind of need to open up your SKUs and grow more variety of things. You know, you want to have a couple sativa, indicas, hybrids. You want some things that are higher testing, lower testing. And then we also wanted um, a CBD strain. So it's a two to one THC rich CBD. So it gives you a nice mellow high, but it's really relaxing. And, you know, especially for people that are just starting um, you know, to smoke cannabis, that's something that's really easy for them to get into it. Um, and then also all of a sudden, Autumn, her husband and my dad um, went to Vegas for, you know, one of these big trade shows for marijuana, look at all the industry, and they found this future roll of knockbox that had, you know, been around for a little while. So now we're making a pre-roll line. <laughs> so it's just like things kind of slowly evolved and we did one step at a time and didn't try to expand to too many SKUs at once, but see what our greenhouses and our limitations are. So we normally grow around 11 to 13 varieties at a time. Now, again, you're the farm side of the situation. You're not the dispensary. So you sell uh, to various dispensaries and that's the way, it, that's the way the product gets distributed. Is that the, is that the, uh, can, the California method? So we package over here and it's in final form, tamper sealed. So that's what the consumer is going to okay. buy, but it has to be picked up by another distributor license. They have to quarantine it for a third party um, testing lab to come in. They test it once it passes its COA, um, then it can be released and sold to dispensaries, which is another license. So then as far as what you sell, then you sell uh, jars of leaf, a uh, flower jars, uh, uh, pre rolls, and some CBD ointment. Did I get most of everything that you have on the? It's a. It's actually not a CBD ointment. It's um. It's a full spectrum, um, salve, pain relieving salve. So it is a one to it has two. Both. Yes, has both. And because yeah. THC is really important, that's where we really get the pain relief. But the CBD right. for the inflammation relief. Um. So and that is actually manufactured off site. So we send our send our flower to a manufacturer. He's able to cold press and manufacture it into oil. So it's full spectrum. It's everything. You're getting all the terpenes, all the cannabinoids. A lot of products out there, they will uh, create it into distillate and strip it apart. But we want right. it together because you really get all the benefits that way. And then it's sent to a developer, also all in Santa Barbara County here locally. And then they developed it and put it all together into this amazing formulation. Um, and then that is also then picked up by the distributor and then sold off to the dispensaries. But it is, yeah, we're very proud of that sell. The um, 
branding that goes on is always fascinating to me. And I've had a few branding conversations. One thing that's interesting is that, of course, the way it was branded before when it was, uh, you know, the black market, uh, you could steal other people's names. So there was a lot of branding that was on the back of other things. So like Gorilla Glue uh, was a known strain, which, of course, the Gorilla Glue company says, well, you can't do that now that it's legalized. You're going to have to come up with some new names. So some of that's happened. But then there's also... You know, for instance, I recommended it to my parents. I said, you know, you're in Vegas. There's, uh, there's, uh, uh, you can use both. You could do it for uh, personal entertainment if you want, or you could use it for medical. Uh, but the people that were there were very much. It was a lot of brands that were still kind of stuck in, you know, tie dye, Cheech and Chong kind of branding. And as as we look at your brand, obviously, that's not the way you went. You know, you've taken you've taken a, a very you know attractive kind of look and feel how did that start like what like what went into the conversation to make this kind of packaging and this sort of look and feel well when we started you know in the collective model days and you went to a dispensary back then it was just a mason jar full of full of flour right that's how you could get it and then once the regulated markets started you had to have it packaged final form everything like this tamper sealed um so what our first design was more medical because that's kind of where we had stemmed from and so it was mm -hmm. the uh, chemistry symbol of THC. And, um, and then as we kind of got into this into a year, we realized that this wasn't just a medical focused product. This is a health and wellness product. This is something that our bodies naturally um, bind to in our endocannabinoid system. And, and this was just something that's really something that is helps people regulate depending on what kind of element or what's going on in their body. So our focus really changed to being really health and wellness. And that's what you see in our packaging today. Gotcha. It's uh, it's interesting in so many ways to be very white hat about it. Now, the fact that it's, it just is what it is. It's just a business. Does that ever come up? Like when you're talking to people just sort of random, like back in the old days when we could actually get coffee at places and things like that, does, do you still have that sort of stutter in your language? Maybe Hannah, when someone says, you know, so what do you do? And you're like, uh, farm, run a farm. <laughs> I mean, definitely. So when I, we made the transition when I was at college and it was just like, Oh yeah, I'm studying to get a horticulture degree and go grow flowers. But you know, in my mind, I knew I was going to be growing cannabis, <laughs> but no one else knew yet. So it's definitely more hush hush. And then there's, def there's, you know, a couple of years where it was like, oh, okay, yes, you're allowed to talk about this, but it's still kind of like you didn't always choose to. <laughs> right. um, but nowadays, you know, this past year, it's definitely, oh, what do you do? Oh, I grew weed. <laughs> it's not, you know, a big deal anymore. Um, and most people know anyway, so it doesn't really matter what they do. It's all legal and there's no reason to hide it. I'm very proud of it. That's right. Autumn, uh, back to the money thing for a, for a long time and maybe so still, there's a disparity between federal government and state government on what's okay and what's not. Um, so you can't just roll up with your credit card, for instance, at least in a lot of places. In Massachusetts, it's an incredible merry-go-round to try to get money moved around. Uh, which I think is just dramatically dangerous for a lot of these businesses because there's just a lot of these kind of experiences where you're you're carting cash around when you would rather do it any other way. Um, as the systems have changed, as as the rules have changed, where is it now, and where does it need to be in your mind? Well, we certainly started, yeah, with a lot of cash. You're dealing with a lot of cash and everything that you do. Um, but I was fortunate that I was I really stayed on top of trying to get us a bank account. And um, after about six months of endless paperwork and compliant checks, um, we were able to actually get um, a bank account with a credit union. So we have we have been banked for um, well over a year and a half to two years now, That's great. Uh, which makes a huge difference. Um, it, it kind of legitimizes you as well, you know, in a certain way where you're not having to do everything in cash and, and handle it that way. And you can write checks to all your vendors and um, but most of the industry still isn't. And that's why the Safe Banking Act just got put back in to motion again. And it's really important for everyone to be able to operate like other businesses. You know, all these states have legalized, but we're still finding ourselves, you know, stuck handling cash. And especially, you know, this has been a really hard thing in a pandemic. Nobody wants to handle cash. No one wants to, you know, that just adds more risk. So the more that we can do with legislation to really to make a difference and then also getting loans for, you know, different, you know, businesses, you know, we're fortunate that we're still self-funded and we haven't needed any type of um, capital. 
Uh, but, you know, uh, in order to really be able to compete in this industry, a, a lot of businesses really need to get that access. And it's still very challenging. Uh, so every now and again, YouTube comes in and has interesting comments that are related to nothing. So how much money have you made? Uh, billions is the answer, Jimmy. Um, <laughs> sp- you, sp- you can tell because they have flying Teslas, not regular ones. And Space Spear <laughs> says, hi, hi, Space Spear. Um, it, you know, people think about that. They think it's a lot of money, but there's a massive amount of taxation applied to this business too. That is not like any other business run in the United States. So, uh, you know, in your head, you're thinking it's just bags of money. You just grow plants, you sell the plants and there we go. We're all going to have flying Teslas. It's not how it works. You get taxed for everything, don't you? Yeah. I mean, we pay at the state level, probably anywhere from 16 to 20% in cultivation tax, just like straight off our plants. Um, and then at the county level, we pay another four four percent. And then, of course, in the cannabis, it says it's still federally legal. There's the tax code two eighty e, which doesn't allow us to write off normal expenses like a normal business could. So every single month, I actually have to do a full tax planning worksheet to really look at, okay, what are my non-deductible expenses and how much tax am I going to have to pay on top of that? So that we are always staying on top of how much we're going to owe. So we're planning ahead and we don't get stuck at the end with not enough cash flow for that. So the taxes are tremendous in this industry. That's why I brought up Jimmy's question. I mean, for all I know, he's being funny, but you know, people think it's like so sexy, but you know, you're not the Colombian cartel, you're a farm. <laughs> you know, no no one goes into farming thinking, boy, am I gonna strike it? You know, it is not even in California do you like look at those really rich farmers. Uh it doesn't work that way. But it, I'm grateful, I'm grateful for you sharing all that information. So the uh the whole scenario, the whole opportunity to to learn about this kind of thing. Who is the kind of person who decides they're going to do these sorts of things? Who who's the kind of person? I guess you have to have a farm background if you're going to be on this side of it. Who who makes the decision to start a business like this? I guess. Like, let's not- say there's a nice young lady <laughs> sitting here thinking, "I wonder what I'm going to be when I grow up. Should I start a cannabis farm?" <laughs> We get that question a lot uh, from people and wanting to know how how to do it and if they can get involved because people do they want to get into this industry it's new it's exciting um, you know it's but farming is challenging you you certainly need to have the right team um, and have a green thumb I do not have a green thumb I am the <laughs> I I am so grateful for yes for for the rest of our team um, and Hannah and Johnny and and Hans and um, you know to be able to really get into the greenhouse and you know it the, there's a joke that cannabis grows like a weed and it does but it doesn't grow like a weed well it takes a lot of tlc it takes a lot of care and and learning you know and autumn brands is de- dedicated to being pesticide free um as you can see our ladybugs there and i, I probably couldn't say that for most businesses um everyone sprays probably a little bit of pesticide still because it's really hard to uh, grow an agricultural product without pesticides but for us, we really want to be able to provide a natural product. And so we only use um, good pests to combat the bad pests, which which in turn actually allows us to have all these native ladybugs that find their way into our greenhouses on their own and just live there and continuously are laying their larva and creating just this amazing natural habitat um, in our greenhouses. So. You know, it, it is very challenging. Uh, we lose a lot of plants that way. Growing um, any type of agricultural product is always challenging. You never know what's going to happen in the year. You can't control it. Um, but, you know, anybody that really does want to get into cannabis, there's so many different ways, you know, from IT to packaging to any of these auxiliary kind of companies. Um, but if you have a passion for it, then do it. But don't try to be all fancy in the beginning you know, really just grow within your means. And and that's who, you know, Hannah and I and, and Johnny and Hans were, were really dedicated to just um, staying the course and and growing, you know, at a level that we can continue to do it successfully and not con- not take ourselves down because it's really easy to get lost into this and try to try to do more than you can. Um, but but be smart about it. And um, but follow your passion for sure. Beautiful. Autumn and Hannah, stick around. I'm going to have a little bitty panel at the end to ask you some questions. So if you can do that, I'm going to bring you backstage for a minute. Boop, boop. That means I'm going to bring Andrea Bernholz up in just a minute. I have to do a little bit of loving to my brands. Thank you so much, by the way. 
So a few things. If you're an author, you're going to want to make a website because that's how people sell books, you silly fools. Uh, use PubSite, pub-site.com. You can make your own site. It's super quick and easy. It is free for 14 days, and it's only $19.99 a month thereafter. If you want them to make the site for you, that's only $499 US. Or give me $2,000, and I'll do it for you. This show is made on StreamYard, cbrogan.me slash StreamYard. You're going to have to find your own cannabis farm, but you can make a show like this super easy. cbrogan.me slash StreamYard. If you are not finding me attractive enough, you can make your own uh, choice and go to the audio podcast. It's perfectly fair. Uh, the audio podcast is hosted by castos.com, but you just go anywhere that you normally get your podcast. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Stitcher, wherever else I'm running out of names. And hey, do you want a dot online domain? You can get one. See broken at me slash online. You can get one for 99 cents for the first year using the code Chris. There you go. So I'm going to grab Andrea in just one second. But first, uh, uh, Twitch people come to me and say, do I, oh, I've got my first Twitch spammers of the day. If I want to become famous, I could buy followers, primes and viewers on this great website bigfollows.com. Wow, I'm going to be famous, Andrea. And then I'll buy swimwear with it. Hi, Andrea. How are you? Good. How are you doing? You know, it is the best Tuesday that I've had so far this week. Uh, Why is that? Because well, I'm talking to you. House. <laughs> right. We could talk a little bit about Swiminista. So, um, Andrea, you, you're you the founder of Swiminista, but you're known for other brands. You did Rock and Republic. Uh, Titan, you've done all kinds of things. Why was this your path? What made you say, you know what? I got this. I'm, I'm just going to tackle the world and, and and make it my own. And I'm going to start in this particular lane. Tell me a little bit about where you came from. Well, after um, uh, we sold Rock and Republic, I had a baby. So I kind of was tapping out in the fashion industry. And then when I was at Rock and Republic, we didn't do any licenses. We did everything ourselves. We never, um, like when we did shoes, you know, I was in Italy and picking out uh, the factories, picking out leathers and working it. So after we sold it, I, you know, wanted to kind of retire a little bit. And then I was lured into Titan. But I thought the reason why I went to Titan, which was a shoe licensing company who did the likes of Zendaya and Gwen Stefani, the Lamb brand. Um, I had never done a licensing platform. So for me, it was really interesting to learn about it. And I came in as their CEO and um, I realized that I'm an entrepreneur. It has to be my own baby. So you couldn't just choose to make what they had and just grow it. You decided you were going to have to start it yourself, build it yourself, come up with all the pieces yourself. Did we lose you? Oh, did you lose me? I did for a little bit. Okay. Um, so anyway, I finished my contract at Titan. And then not long after that, I was on a holiday in Mexico with girlfriends. And we were all complaining about how our swimwear didn't fit right. You know, it was too big over here or too small over here. Or it kind of popped out. And so everyone, of course, looked at me coming from the fashion industry. They're like, funny. We're just going to have a freezy day with Andrea. Uh-oh. Well, hey, it's live video. It's what we do. Andrea, what I'm going to ask you to do is maybe refresh your browser and see what you could do. Maybe come back on. Okay, right we're back. So my friends encouraged me. They said, why don't you start a swim brand? And my gut reaction, of course, at first was like, no way. And then... You know, it got me thinking and I started going home and I started Frankensteining my suits together, kind of putting things together, sewing them up. And, you know, I've lived in Southern California and Hawaii my whole life. So a swimsuit is an integral part of your life, you know. So um, it just kind of it came from there. And, um, you know, I'm a little bustier, so it was really hard to find something that was supportive. I didn't want anything to bind behind my neck. So it was all about problem solving swimwear and making it sexy at the same time. Because if you know, in the past, if you found something to cover yourself, you look like grandma or you're wearing a sports bra. Um, otherwise, it was, you'd pop out. So, um, you know, I just, I got the opportunity to interview hundreds of women and ask them what they liked about swimwear. What are they missing? What do they want to see? 
So it was all about comfort, support, sexiness, confidence. And, you know, then for myself as um, growing up in a very eco-friendly environment, you know, my parents were kind of the original hippies and we, I grew up recycling. So that was a really big component I wanted to add to the brand. So all of our materials are made out of post-consumer plastics, like plastic bottles, and all of our packaging is either recyclable or um, compostable as well. And then we started our kids' line too. Yeah. I noticed that there's a lot of different cuts, obviously, because there's, you know, different people have different areas that they want to handle a different way. So for instance, right. bubbly bottom is different than some of the other kinds of opportunities here. Uh, in the process, what does that mean for your kind of like, how many SKUs do you have to have to maintain this kind of fit? And what does that mean to the people who want to wear the swimwear? Um, well, I don't have as many SKUs as it kind of looks because I have them recolored. But what I tried to do was like, okay, hey, if you still want something kind of sexy, but you need something to cover your tummy, here's a few styles. If you want something super, super sexy and super cheeky, here's a few styles. So I tried to accommodate a few different styles, um, you know, per kind of body area. And another really great thing about Swimanisa is I've tried to incorporate um, adjustability. So if you've got bottoms, you know, that adjust. So sometimes you're in between a size or sometimes you're a little bigger or smaller and you can adjust the sides. You can um, adjust, you know, how cheeky something is. So you can almost customize it to yourself so that you can get the optimal fit so you feel really confident. Gotcha. And that was a really big, important, important part. And the fact that I get these text messages or emails from customers saying, you know, or reviews, how comfortable and how confident they feel that to me is absolute success when i make other women feel great it's the happiest i love those emails there's so many options i mean i look at like bold bottom where you know it, it can go for someone who maybe is working with that the front side of that area and trying to fix that up i'm trying to use words that i don't know what I, the words are but they're basically well, they're, they're, you know we have the little pooch so some that yeah. is a great suit that kind of sucks it in Right. And it has the adjustability to make it higher or lower on your body. Thank you for saving me. The whole thing you got it. it. <laughs> uh, and, and like you said, some people, I mean, swimwear seems to have just like a few different sizes. One is for, you know, quite busty. One is absolutely no bust. And there seems to be nowhere in between. And it doesn't really kind of uh, work on those experiences, right? So your point about not wanting it to pull at your neck was kind of interesting too. That when you when you think about that, do you engineer a lot of this based on kind of your concerns or did, and then it grew out into everybody else or like, how do you, how do you pull in your. Well, your... it was collectively um, a joint uh, conversation, if you will, amongst my friends of things that hurt your neck or things that you, you, you popped out all the time or things didn't fit right. So those were the same concerns that I had with swimwear and the same problems that I was having. So um, that's when I started, like I said, Frankensteining different suits together to get the optimal fit. And then I had the um, the good fortune to have a, a swim store that was not too far from my house. And the owners there, they've been in the business 20 years, body and soul in Tarzana. And they let me just go in and talk to women and ask them what they liked. I was able to try, you know, have them try on some samples to see if women did like this. And, you know, having the adjustability and having things being able to crisscross or just be a bra strap. Um, people really responded well to that. Women really, um, you know, grabbed onto that. And I've expanded into different styles. And now you saw I've expanded into the kids' collection, some caftans, mm -hmm. songs. And um, I was also super fortunate to have um, a collaboration with Christian Lacroix. And that's one of the beautiful prints right there. And for those of you who don't know, um, just hang up the phone. No, um, <laughs> Lacroix, he's a fabulous designer. He's known for his amazing prints. And he um, went more into the housewares and home goods in the last few years. And then I heard that they were doing collaborations with different brands. So I jumped on board, actually jumped on a plane to Paris <laughs> and met with them and we did the collaboration and it's proving to be amazing. And it's it's so great to go through this entire amazing catalog of all these cool prints and then incorporating them onto some of our best sellers. And it's, um, it's, it's doing phenomenal. 
There's some really interesting colors in the Christian Lacroix collection that are just things I wouldn't expect in this sort of almost stained glass kind of look and all that. There's some, some yeah. real interesting moves. Uh, I, I alluded to a slightly humorous, but also true. I mean, everybody put on their COVID-15, so they're going to have to oh, be yeah. thinking a little differently about swimwear. What else has changed for you as a business uh, because of you know the last year or so? And what's been what's been good for it and bad for it? And where have you had to kind of put your extra calories in your all your years of experience to bear? Well, I will say at first I was kind of freaked out for about a day. I was I was like, what am I going? Oop, we lost Andre again. Well, so far we've been good at only losing her for five or six seconds at a time. So we'll see what happens. I'll just smile and wait. Hope. Okay, and we're back. So at first I was very concerned, obviously, like the rest of the world. And I had a lot of orders cancel. I had um, like a trunk show tour at the Four Seasons cancel. So I had to wrap my head around like, what what can I do, right? right. And um also, I had to show and be a good example for my daughter of like, okay, you know, when the stuff hits the fan, what are you going to do? You can't just close your business and call it a day. You have to like work it out. And so what I did was I really, I took the time during COVID to realize people are going to shop online. So I redid my entire website. I implemented a fit guide. So you put in your own sizing so that it really takes a lot of the questions and, um, out of, out of what size you are, you know, so you can really get what size you are. It's very true to size. So that's been a really big help for us. And also the new imagery has been wonderful. And just, um, just rethinking how the whole online world works. Then I also went online kind of guerrilla style. And so like you were saying, there's, you know, a lot of people gained weight during COVID, right? But then there's the other camp that lost a lot of weight. They took that as an opportunity to get fit. So a lot of these women on Instagram, you know, they started, hey, this is my weight loss journey. This is. Normally when things break, I get crazy, but I just really like how Andrea is so just nonplussed. She's just like, fine, I'll just reboot again. All right, there we go. Um, so the women who, you know, were posting photos about their their weight loss and they're getting fit. I reached out to them. I said, Hey, you know, good for you. You should get a bathing suit, go shopping. <laughs> you right. know, and it's true. Like good, good for them. Like, um, I know I was, I was a casualty of the, of the, uh, COVID 10. Also, I got myself together now and it's gone, but, um, <laughs> so I, I empathize both camps there, but you know, I think just reaching out on a personal level and really, um, talking with women. And even now I love when I get comments on, the swimwear or people ask me personal questions or styling questions or they're going on holiday. What do they suggest? It's really fun for me to, to be able to do that. You have a lot of fans of how you're handling freezing, uh, which is <laughs> kind of fun. I said, you know, this really points to your, your skill sets uh, in, in managing chaos. Um, <laughs> when this brand comes to its logical conclusion, as I'll do, like, you know, I'm pretty sure you're not going to have swimmingista on your tombstone uh you have like four or five other companies still left in you what makes you i mean you're obviously you got to focus on the baby that you're with and you have to drive this thing how do you look at the portfolio of your career and what you've been doing professionally and how do you advise others um my advice as far as advising others is just to really stick to what you're passionate about and keep forging through you know um no matter what there's always going to be obstacles, even when things are fantastic, you know, in the economy or however, and you just have to just stick to, through it. And I know it's always easier said than done, but we always have to have the belief that everything will be all right. It may not be exactly the picture that we had it in our heads, but everything will work itself out. That's really good advice, uh, especially on days when we keep freezing. Um, right. <laughs> Andrea, what, what's, you know, we talked about the ecological side of things. We talked about the fact that, you know, it's, it's post-consumer plastic and all that, and that there's, there's just a lot of steps you're taking to that. Uh, what other ways are you working in sort of making values matter in the company? And how do you express that? Like, What's the, what's the soft, smushy side of all of what you're doing at Swimanista? 
Well, um, my heart is like a rock. I, there is no soft side. No, um, <laughs> no, you know, I really, I, I love, uh, we're doing a beach cleanup actually later this afternoon. Um, we're always like on a personal level, I'm always cleaning up beaches. I'm always constantly recycling. Um, I'm always, you know, if, if I get straws someplace, which drives me nuts, I take them home, put them in paper and I put them through our shredder. So at least, you know, they don't become a weapon to see life and, you know, just, trying to to be kind to other people and share a, a smile with people, you know, um, as silly as maybe that sounds, I think when you're kind to people and respectful to people, uh, you don't always get it back, but it's out there in the universe and putting really positive things out there. You know, when I grew up, my mother would always say, put positive out in the yeah, atmosphere. And I kind of thought she was like silly or whatever, but it's really true. You know, when you kind of this word manifest things or, you know, I think if you put, what you want out there, you you do get it back. And it's not like instantaneous all the time, but I like to really give people a chance. I like to really work with people, like employees come in and maybe, you know, um, they're not doing exactly what I'd like them to do. I don't just get rid of somebody or, you know, I work with them to let them know exactly what I need for the company, what we're striving for. You know, every uh, order that goes out is has a personal handwritten note from, myself or somebody on my team that, you know, Hey, enjoy your suit, enjoy. Or some people say I'm going to Mexico or can you rush this? I'm going on holiday. It's like, yeah, great. Have a wonderful holiday. You know, um, I like to share the shopping experience at home. Like you're opening a gift almost, you know, and I just, I like to have fun and I like to enjoy life. And I just, I hope that that is expressed in everything that we do. And everyone works really hard. We do a lot of photo shoots. We do a lot of shipping, a lot of, grunt work and um, working in the warehouse. So there's all different aspects of everything. And it's really cool and important to show my daughter that as well. And, you know, it's, it's good to get your brain functioning and all these different things. And it's really important and integral for anybody who's starting a business to know every single aspect of the business. I may not excel at every single aspect, but at least I know, like if something happens, I can jump in and, do the invoicing. I, I do packaging. I do shipping. I do I, ordering things, you know, um, every single aspect. It's it's really vital for your business that you know that. So you know how it's done and you know how it's done right. There's such a big distance between what you put together for a brand at Rock and Republic and what you have here. What what could you take with you and what and what will you take with you into a new brand? If someone says, Andreas, stop this tomorrow, you gotta go launch this new product. You know, let's pretend it's another, you know, clothing uh, line or something. What, where's the where's the thread, or do, do we cut that? We always have to start from a, a you know tabula rasa. Did we freeze her on the perfect smile? Look, I just got a shit look. I mean, that's perfect. Nobody looks at nobody makes a freeze face like that. If you get a freeze face from me, you know what you're gonna get. Unbelievable. She even freezes perfectly. Uh, well, the thread, <clears throat> the thread that I carry out is with branding and consistency. You know, um, I've got our stickers and boxes and everything that that's branded really cool and clean. Uh, I've taken a lot of cues from Rock and Republic um, as far as the construction of a garment. You know, we didn't invent denim, invent denim at Rock and Republic, right? But we just made it better. You put it on, and you didn't realize what made it better, you know, it's just moving a little seam to the front. So your thigh looks a little smaller. It's like all these little details. And I've taken those cues and I've brought that into my swimwear. So like I have ruching on the tush. So your butt looks rounder. I have, you know, hidden supports. I have all these different little hidden things that you put it on. You're like, I don't know why I love this, but I just love it. So it's like the, the little tiny details, the hidden details that make things better. And it's, it's really like every single piece is very thought out. Everything that I do has a reason. So if I were to do anything else, it just would happen, happen it would have to happen organically. Like I didn't leave Rock and Republic or Titan and think, oh, I'm gonna start a swim brand because that's gonna be cool. It was just out of necessity. And Rock and Republic started the same way. I had a different business with my partner. He made a pair of jeans for his girlfriend and we're like, okay, great. This would be a fun little hobby, right? We just wanted to get enough money that we would have health insurance for the company. And it started out that way. And then all the other um, uh, brands, not brands, all the other 
costumes and handbags and everything else that came out of Rock and Public was kind of necessity. It's like, oh, well, we're doing a fashion show. Gosh, I wish we had shoes. Oh, you know, I wish I had a shirt to go with this. And then we started to make things. So it was always a very organic process. Wow. And I think that's when passion really comes into it, when it's an organic process. Like I am so into making suits and designing things and making them comfortable and making them, um, you know, something that women can love and being adjustable and comfortable. It, it's all the elements that you want in a brand. And that's what I try to bring to people. So no matter what I do, it would have to be something, like I said, organic, and it has to be something good and positive. Beautiful. All right. I'm grabbing back Autumn and Hannah, and we're getting near the end of this little canary show, but we did it. Uh, freezes and all, we did it. Um <laughs> You know, as you as you hear this, I mean, I have three women founders on. I have three people who run women businesses. Uh, it's not as easy. It's not as uh, the road is not as paved with as good intent as we would hope. What do we want to say to people? What do, what do they need to know about the good, the bad of it, how you're treated along the way, and what other people need to understand about this? I guess I'll make that question to everybody, but whoever is inspired to answer first, what's it like to run a, a business as a women owned business and, and what do you wish you had more of or less of? <laughs> That's a lot of questions. Um, you know, for us to start with your first part is, you know, paying it forward. So we were very lucky in our industry that we were deemed essential in this pandemic. And so being able to give back to people um, is, is crucial. And when the pandemic hit for us, how we were able to help um, in different ways was one, we ended up buying our employees lunch three times a week with other farms in town to help keep the lights on for the restaurants that could no longer function. Um, Hannah and Hans were um, key in setting up a nonprofit that was able to also really help. And, and she can um, talk more about that. Um, you know, so being able to really give back, and as Andrea said, it, you know, it always comes back to you as well, you know, but, but that's not why you necessarily do it. You just do it because it's really important to pay it for it to anybody and everybody that you can. So as you grow and you become more successful or, you know, even a little bit more, it's always great to be able to just share that with whoever you possibly can. I can't believe I had another frozen version of Andrea. Oh, I, can you hear me now? Here we go. We're good. <laughs> I gotta put you back where you were though, because I'm weird. Uh, Hannah, do you want to add to that a little bit? Yeah. So in the beginning, um, when the COVID quarantine started, there were a lot of people that you know normally go to school and they're students and they get fed at school or um, different situations where people are getting food, and we realized that the food bank that was once a month seeing you know. 200 cars was now trying to ramp it up to every week and seeing 600 cars. And so we're trying to figure out besides just volunteering, how we could help and figure out how to get the people that needed this food who were previously getting it from these different programs could still receive it. So with um, my dad and I are in a local Rotary Club. So we use their charitable foundation to set up um, the 93013 fund. Uh, and one of the first things we did was start these food boxes. So every week we're working with the local, um, it's called the farm cart. And so they have a farm cart in town and they do boxes that people purchase every week or every two weeks. And so now we were purchasing these boxes and handing them out to the different people on the school's list that always get food. So it was, you know, you have that control of, these are the people who really need it, let's get it to them. We also started doing dinners um, for the old folks home and people that were, you know, so isolated. And so just this weekly dinner was kind of giving them all this hope and the letters that we received just saying like, this is what they're looking forward to every week. And this was before the government was all set up to step in and take over. So we did it for about three months and then the grants came in and we got to say, okay, take it, keep going wow. <laughs> to other people. Big karma rolling in <laughs> over there. Um, and, uh, still going forward. You know, Andrea, I'm going to give you a slightly different question. Everybody else can answer it too. But Janice had this question. What's the advice you wish you knew when you started? Um, I wish I knew um, <laughs> not to start. No kidding. Yeah, I, wish I, knew, I wish I knew um, how important every single little tiny detail is 
you know, you just think, oh, I don't know, let's do a website. But it's like the tedious little details. I kind of forgot when I started Rock and Republic, it was my gosh, in 2000. So, and we sold it in 2011. So a lot of time has passed and um, really starting something from scratch, just as something um, I wish I had remembered about the details. You know, you want a t-shirt logo? Well, you have to do it, you know, measure how many inches down from the collar, how many inches over, how big, all the, the little things you just, you have a vision in your head, but then uh, getting it executed is a whole nother story. It's huge. Autumn Shelton, what do you think? There are so many different aspects to our company, right? So we're one, we're growing an agricultural product, which is hard in itself. And then you're creating a branded consumer product, which is just a whole nother world of um, difficulty um, and learning what the consumer wants and how to develop it and making sure you're really providing a, a consistent, um, amazing product. Um, and then there's the other side of it that this is a new industry. And so all the regulations and all the compliance and everything is still still getting worked out today you know we were part of it it was it was you know you had to really be able to um adjust instantly um so you know something that we're really in still is you know we were able to get through it at the state level but we're still at the county level trying to get through this process and it's been two and a half years and so that's my big one where i wish throughout this process that we've we've gone through i wish i would have known how to how to uh, make it go a lot faster than where we are today by understanding what the county needed or what the rules and um, and regulations were um, a long time ago. Um, so for me, that's really where I, I definitely, if I had a um, magic ball, that's what I would have hoped for. <laughs> that's what they, they sure did make it easy though, because they change all the rules all the time and they, they make it, you know, draconian and hidden from view, but it's what we get. All right, well, we're getting close to rolling out of this whole show, so I got a couple more things left to do. Oh, and here's our person of the day. Kaboom! So my person of the day, I'm going to give it to Janice. And, I, you know, I was going to give it to Janice just because I really liked that she liked how Andrea handled her freezes. <laughs> um, but, you know, just in general. Uh, that's our person of the day. So that entitles you to a whole free apple. You just have to go buy it yourself, clean it up and eat it. And you'll be great. Everything wonderful. So we ask every single guest who's ever been on the show, what goes in your backpack? And this could be something physical. It could be something metaphorical. It could be something like an avocado. Uh, Saida Trujillo said avocado because she said, you know, it can add to a meal. Sometimes it can satisfy you as your only meal of the time. Uh, and then it could be something like, pride in where one is from and that was from uh, Horacio Garcia Rojas who is a Mexico City based uh, horror comedy actor of the show Diablero still playing on Netflix so worth watching so uh, I think I'll start with Hannah Hannah what is something that goes in your backpack so I definitely think that you're going to need some snacks <laughs> whether you're going into the fashion industry and starting your own business or finding your passion in the cannabis space or any type of farming you know when something's really your passion it's not going to be a quick success it's going to take time and you know this land use stuff that autumn's going through yeah it's taking 10 times as long as we thought so she needs lots of snacks to get to the finish line <laughs> all right so what's a good snack what's in there um, so we always have like kind bars here, those granola bars, those are always good. But if you want to fit into that swimsuit, you know, an apple, banana. <laughs> That's not bad. Uh, you could try uh, bunch bars. We had the guest on yesterday selling bunch bars, all natural and blah, blah, blah. So there's a uh, dark almond and there's peanut butter. Autumn Shelton, what goes in the backpack? Um, I'm going to say what goes in my backpack is staying true to who you are. You know, we've gone down this road now for a number of years and we've had some uh, people walk into our walk, walk in our door and try to dangle a little carrot that didn't really feel right to us and um, was very arrogant or very out of line with who we are. And so our, our mantra for sure is definitely stay true to who we are, stay the course. Um, and that's really helped us, our two families that um, own and operate this business, um, continue to grow and and just have a lot of fun together. That's a biggie. I have a lot of thoughts on that, but I'm almost out of show here. Andrea Bernholtz, what should go in the backpack? Confidence, kindness, honesty, and lots of water. Oh. 
Lots of water. I like it. <laughs> Lots of water. Well, I'm right by the Atlantic Ocean, which is not nearly as fun to run and jump into right now in uh, March. But, you know, I, I have the polar bear thing going. I guess I could do that. Uh, but we could do that, too. That's a good one. I like that. We could uh, we could end with that. Well, I was thinking about, how, you know, how does this all tie together? And obviously, you know, three very strong women. And I will tell you that my grandmother was a one-piece woman her whole life. Um, but there was one time she really considered a bikini. And I'll tell you the one thing that she thought about that made her consider it. <laughs> 